So welcome. Uh, today we would be starting up with uh, our uh, next version which is on multilayer perceptrons to deep neural networks and while uh, in the earlier lectures we have all uh, studied about what neural networks are and uh, we have done a few uh, lab uh, sessions as well on uh, and that was about just understanding neural networks from a classification point of view. And now where the extension comes down in perspective of uh, visual computing is that uh, here uh, in contrary to what we were doing in the earlier uh, uh, classes uh, was that in the earlier classes uh, while we were using feature extractors and feature descriptors which are hard coded functions over there in order to describe an image and then we extended all the summary or the synopsis coming out of each of these feature descriptors together into a classification framework using a neural network. On the contrary, today when we are going to do it, so here is when a neural network itself has to come down to be an end-to-end -end learning framework, which means that input to the uh, neural network itself is an image, while the output from it is still a classification uh, uh, output. So it can be a classification output, it can be a regression output, any of these things which come out. So where we would start down very specifically is that uh, here we are going to look into a multilayer perceptron and that is our starting point and from there eventually we will enter into what is known as the deep neural networks and then what are their existential criteria and how they work. So effectively uh, we would be doing a basic uh, review of the perceptron model and the perceptron learning rule once again and then entering into the multilayer perceptron from there we enter into something called as the signal flow graph representation and this model of a signal flow graph is how is uh, my input and my output related and what happens during the learning phase and this is a, a quite critical part over here since uh, in the last lecture and the lab which we had done so you were introduced to the concept of uh, error back propagation and uh, from there we had a, a gradient descent based learning rule now what exactly happens in telling this as a error back propagation and why uh, it happens the way it has it has been named and what you have seen down in different snippets of code is what we are going to explain uh, you through this uh, signal flow graph representation. Following that is a very important aspect about gradient calculation and that is to show down what happens within these functions and uh, whether the gradient is just uh, for the classification cost function or then or does it need to exist throughout uh, the network and that is where we will enter into something called as an existential criteria for uh, the network to exist. And all other transformations and cost functions also to exist and then eventually go down to the learning rule and from there uh, we uh, more or less come down to an end of uh, what happens with them with the, these kind of deep neural networks. So as with a simple neural model, so just to do a brief recap of what it was. So say that there were three inputs over here in the earlier case uh, last week when we were doing it. So these were uh, given down as features, say three different features, but here now this, these are no more three different features, but these three can be three pixels. So you can consider just three pixels in an image and give them as an input to the, so the pixel in its own way, or it can be even say for a given pixel in colored space, if you have uh, one particular image in a RGB color space, so each component itself is represented as one independent scalar value. So your X1 can be the red value of a pixel, x2 can be the green value of a pixel, x3 can be the blue value of a pixel and accordingly so per pixel basis you can make some sort of a decision coming out as well. So let the decision associated with a particular uh, pixel over here be p hat and now with the simple neuron model what would happen is that uh, we will have a weighted combination of these inputs going down to a neuron and from there add down a bias take a summation out over there and this summation is what is has what has this form. So it is w0 plus w1 x1 plus w2 x2 plus w3 x3 where each of these weights w1, w2 and w3 are three weights associated with uh, each of the three values x1, x2 and x3 and w0 is what is called as the bias or the one w0 can also be written down as 1 into b where say b is the weight over there and the constant input to this uh, particular edge over there is what is 1. Okay. So in its uh, linear algebra form which is in its matrix representation this is the form which you would be getting now. So you get y is equal to the uh, inner product or the dot product of two matrices. One of them is the weight matrix where you have the weights and the bias taken together and the other matrix is a column matrix over there. So that is why it is x comma 1 transpose where x is uh, this uh, scalar arrangement 
so capital X is basically a matrix arrangement of these three scalars which you get down over here. Now having taken all of them together, the next part is to apply some sort of a nonlinearity and that's the FNL nonlinear function which you get down over here. And these nonlinearities can have uh, multiple different forms and we consider these two forms over here. The first form is called as the sigma, the second one is called as the tan hyperbolic nonlinearity. And uh, to do a very basic recap, so you remember that in sigma what happens is that as the value of y tends towards plus infinity, this value tends towards plus 1. As the value of y tends towards minus infinity, this value tends towards 0. And on the contrary, with a tan hyperbolic, what happens is as the value of y tends towards plus infinity, you get a value which is uh, saturating at plus 1. As the value of y tends towards minus infinity, you get a value of uh, this nonlinearity which is at minus 1. So taking these two together is um, I, I, either one of them you can be using now and based on whichever you are using your p hat's value will appropriately be decided. So if your p hat uh, has the nonlinearity associated as a tan hyperbolic its value will be in the range of minus 1 to plus 1. If it has sigmoid as nonlinearity then its value will be in the range of 0 to 1. And uh, this was the simple perceptron model which we had made. Now from taking down a perceptron to getting into a neural network formulation which is that given I can have multiple kinds of uh, inputs over there, it can be different kinds of scalars over there and I can map it down to again a different group of scalars. So maybe my first prediction over there is what is called as p1 hat and this will be the form of representing uh, everything to my p1 hat. Now note over here uh, that uh, uh, as we had also discussed in the earlier class is that these weights are no more uh, with just one subscript but there are two subscripts which you see with these weights 1 comma 2 1 comma 1 1 comma 3 now the reasoning behind these weights is that the first subscript is to the target where it's mapping so the output over here say i have x2 which goes to y1 and that eventually maps down to my target which is called as p1 so my first subscript is going to be the subscript of the target. My second subscript on the weight is the subscript of the source from where it is connecting. And that's the nomenclature which we are following. Now, if I arrange all of these weights uh, W11, W12 and W13 in a row matrix form, then that is what is written down as this bold W1, which is the matrix given down in the equation. Okay. Along with that, I have my scalar value, which is my bias W10 or B1. Okay, and uh, accordingly x is my uh, uh, x x comma 1 transpose is my column vector which comes down and this gets my inner dot product and then my nonlinearity applied. Similarly, if I take down my second uh, neuron on the output side of it and uh, feed it appropriately, so I would be getting down this uh, second part of the partial network coming down and my group of equations which represent that. Now projecting onto this and going out similarly, so I can have my xjth neuron connected down to my ykth neuron with a weight which is called as w k comma j and then put a impose on nonlinearity on top of it and then taking all of them together this is a particular form where I get where w subscript k is a row, row vector which uh, which has a size of uh, uh, so, so the number of uh, connections over there will be basically from 1 to j which is because that is a total number of uh, x says which you have over here. So for uh, uh, this combination this is a particular kind of an output relationship which we see. Now if you look into this uh, matrix of uh, weights and uh, biases which are combined together then you can see down that all of these uh, uh, outputs which I see y1, y2 up to yk. So if I take all of these together and just uh, concatenate them. So I arrange them in a column form, uh, uh, in a col uh, in, in a column major format, which is that uh, it it is it just has a k number of rows and just one column over there. Accordingly, my bias B that can also be arranged into a column matrix over there. Okay, so these are the two matrices which we see over here, and then my W uh, each of these W1, W2 up to WK. They can also be stacked one on top of the other because each is independent of the other one. And now that would give me some sort of a rectangular matrix. Now if I clearly look into it, then my total transformation equation over here can be written down in terms of just a matrix multiplication. So this will be a matrix multiplication of my weights, w's and b bias, these two kinds of matrix with the input over there, which is arranged as a matrix. 
and then that gives me an output matrix over there and this output matrix is a column matrix my input matrix is also a column matrix so that's my y and then uh, i have a nonlinearity applied on a matrix which means that uh, each element of the matrix is appropriately uh, subjected to the nonlinearity over there and then taking all of them together is what i get down as my target output so this was my uh, very basic understanding of how a neural network works down as such and then this was uh, what we had done with a multilayer perceptron in the last class itself now again uh, going down a bit more into the revision part over there so my error in prediction how it was defined was that uh, if i have one of these predictors p1 then i get down one uh, value of a scalar error for another predictor e, uh, p2 i get down another error which is e2 now if i have an array of these predicted variables over there then i cannot keep on calculating each and every error singly because in that case i don't get a consolidated uh, knowledge about the total network as such so in order to do that what we do is we find out what is the euclidean uh, error over there so a euclidean error or the total error of the network is basically a scalar value which is the euclidean norm or the l2 norm of my uh, of all my predictors so whatever is my actual ground truth which is p and my predicted value p hat these two matrices are subtracted and then you take a uh, uh, the amplitude of that or the l2 norm of these two subtractions so and given that the next part is that you will be doing a back propagation in order to learn down your algorithm so the idea is that you have these uh, uh, successive uh, bunch of observations and predictions and what is the ground truth so if x1 is a matrix uh, is a of all of these uh, scalar x's over there and one of these samples is x subscript 1 then the ground truth corresponding to that is what is p subscript 1 and at any given point of time when you feed the whole uh, data x subscript 1 through your network you would be getting down a predicted value which is p hat subscript 1 okay so similarly i take my uh, input sample as x subscript 2 and i feed it forward through my network i get a p hat subscript 2 okay while the actual ground truth over there is p2 so i keep on uh, doing this uh, together and then for my nth sample which is my last sample in my uh, training data over there as i feed my last sample through my network over there my output is pn hat and then my actual ground truth corresponding to that is pn so together if uh, i have all of this so what you would see is that there comes an error which is there for each sample so for my first sample second sample third sample till my nth sample i will be getting a different value of error but can we give uh, some sort of a consolidated error for the network in terms of its performance across all of these training examples which we are taking down and for that reason we devise another uh, metric which is called as the cost function of the whole network in terms of its weights now that's what is defined as uh, j w over here and that's a summation of the euclidean distance between these predicted uh, p and the actual observed uh, and the actual ground truth of these p's which are supposed to be there now if you look into this cost function over there uh, what we said is that j w is your cost function where uh, these varies in terms of your weights which are w's now what comes down definitely in uh, somebody's mind is that why is it varying with respect to uh, something called as a w and the reason is that these w's are weights which are the only thing which uh, now would be guiding down and uh, accordingly manipulating what happens to your uh, predictions over there so because there there isn't anything else on which it can change see my input x is constant um, so that that will be different number of samples and across samples and across uh, so uh, between two samples it will be a different value that's always known but when I'm training across an epoch learning, which we had done uh, studied in the last classes as well. So when you're training across epochs, what happens is every epoch, you are going to send the same sample over there. The only reason why the prediction value bit of putting down the same sample. So say at my uh, first epoch, which is my uh, epoch number zero over there, I put down X one as my sample and I get down a predicted value P one hat. I do all my updates and everything. And then comes to my second epoch, which is uh, epoch one. In my epoch one, I put down x one. I would be getting down a different value, which is um, p one hat. But p one hat at the epoch one is very different from p one hat at epoch zero. And the only reason why this was changing is uh, within the network, the only variable component is weight, which changes. 
So that is the reason why we would write down this cost function in terms of our weights itself. Now that I have my cost function written down in terms of my weights, my final point is that we need to come down to a point where uh, to a point in the weight space such that my argument of these cost functions is minimum or as I keep on um, it says the, the, the point is that if we keep on changing the weights there will be one particular combination of these weights such that my error is minimum and that is the exact one which I would like to achieve. Now and how that is achieved is through something called as the gradient descent learning rule. So, in this gradient descent learning rule what we do is basically that it is an iterative process in which what you do is you start with some randomized assumption of weights uh, in the first epoch and, and uh, say that is wk okay? and then you compute out whatever is your gradient of uh, the weight space over there in terms of your cost function and that is del del w of jw and then you weigh it by a factor an empirical factor which is called as eta or also known as the learning rate. So, what this controls is that uh, your uh, gradient of this error function over there del del w of jw that can have any range of a value. Now, if the range of say this w weights are in a range of 0 to 1 and then say my del del w of jw is in a range of uh, 10 power of minus 9. So, the rate at which it would be updating the, or, or impacting the value of w is going to be very less and in that case this eta factor over here comes to your rescue because what you can do is you can set a eta factor say 10 power of 6. So, if you multiply your value in 10 power of minus 9 to a value of 10 power of 6 that will put me give me a value which is in the range of 10 power minus 3 and that value is something which will actually be impacting significantly how the value of w is changing over there. So, this learning rate basically is a fact way of mathematically modulating the gradient over there such that uh, we have a value of this error and the gradient coming down which will be in some way significantly impacting the change in w and that is how my w of k plus 1 will be revising at a much better rate than w of k uh, would have if uh, we did not have this uh, learning rate called as eta. Now, given that uh, we have all of this done, so what typically happens within a gradient based learning rule is something like this that uh, you would be starting down on your first epoch uh, and then as you change these case. So, you will be getting your uh, first value of jw based on your jw you would be calculating your gradient uh, multiplying that with your empirical constant eta or the learning rate and then you update your w to w of k plus 1. As you update it to w of k plus 1 you would be getting a different factor of jw which is jw of k plus 1 and accordingly this keeps on changing and so on and so forth till you are at the final conclusive step over there. Okay. Now, this was one way of uh, trying to visualize uh, our uh, learning in terms of its cost function versus epochs and this can be a typical graph. So, you would often be seeing that uh, you start with a particular error and your error increases and then keeps on decreasing or it may so happen that it increases then keeps on decreasing and suddenly again hits a local maxima it increases slightly then goes down it may keep on jittering and these are all aspects about uh, what is happening within the learning itself. So, if your value of eta may you can keep your value of eta very very less in that case what will happen is it will come down very slowly, but it will be a very smooth transition which it will be getting. If your value of eta is very high then it can start oscillating and jittering over there and that means that it is basically overshooting the local minima point at every time when it is coming down somewhere closer to the local minima and these are different issues which we would be tackling down through experimental processes and some more learning experiences subsequently. Now, looking at the same part of uh, gradient descent again in the weight space. So, what we had uh, learnt was that uh, say I start with some random value over there and this is my point and if I so here what I am doing is typically I am looking into two different plots. So, one is my plot of epoch versus cost function the other is my plot of weight space versus cost function and these are two different aspects as such. So, the second epoch when I update my weight so it shifts to a different weight vector coordinate over there and subsequently I have a different cost function value also calculated through it and subsequently it goes to the next one then to the next one and, and uh, finally to my convergence. Now, if you look into this part of uh, the plot what you would see is that for any kind of a perceptron model you would be seeing that uh, the error function over there forms some sort, sort of a VV structure which uh, quite uh, mimics a egg casket like design where uh, you have multiple number of crests and troughs present over there. 
So as these uh, points of my weights, they keep on moving down, they would always be encircling and coming down to my local minima point as soon as possible. And the way it comes down to this local minima is what is my learning which is happening. And also from the last lecture uh, about introduction to deep learning and what happens within this multilayer perceptron and challenges, you did understand that uh, one, one of the major points is that we can actually initialize a network at any random point over there and based on that it can start converging and oscillating around uh, any of these troughs and that definitely means that where it's going to converge is uh, now some sort of uh, dependent on where I started. If I started down in the neighboring one then it will be in the trough of the neighboring. If say there is no global minima but everything is uh, equivocal uh, uh, point over there, there is no unique global minima in that case. Now if we have a unique global minima then the challenge is obviously that you do not lock into any of these uh, non-global uh, minima positions but rather uh, somehow escape into this from these small uh, trough like regions and exactly converge onto your global minima position. Now having said all of this what uh, comes down to our mind is uh, something interesting. So you have seen that uh, <coughs> there is uh, for any kind of a given network, if I have three different scalar values over there, then I can take in these scalar values and uh, I can predict out one of these uh, uh, predicted outputs over there. Okay. And for a simple perceptron, how it goes down is uh, something of this sort that I have my weights W1, W2 and W3. I take all of these weights together and then uh, I sum them up and accordingly I get down my uh, uh, bias also coming into play and then I map it down to my output over there. Okay. The question is uh, that now that I need to find out my del del w of jw then what would I be doing. So in order to solve it out the best possible way is basically trying to look into something which is called as the chain rule of differentiation which you have done in your high school mathematics itself. So what goes down by the chain rule is that uh, we would try to break down all of these into its constituent component. So the simplest way of doing this is that let us break down this uh, uh, derivative product which is partial derivative of jw with respect to w because we cannot directly compute. So what we will be doing is, uh, so you know that uh, the output of this jw, so jw was a cost function and that was uh, for our case a Euclidean distance of the out predicted output with respect to the ground truth. Okay. So I do not have any component of x as such directly visible, neither my weights directly visible over there. But what I have is definitely my p hat or, or p over here which is my predicted output state. So I can take a derivative of the cost function with respect to this uh, output. Next is my output is dependent on y through a nonlinear function. Okay. So that means that I can take this uh, partial derivative of p with respect to y. Now if I look till the first two partial fractions uh, on my right hand side over there, so you can see that del del w um, uh, of jw can now be represented as a product of del del p of jw and del uh, del y of p. So together these two first two parts over there will give me uh, del del y of jw coming down. Now the next part is now that I have a del del y of jw. I should be getting down another part of the partial fraction which is uh, partial, partial fraction of these derivatives which is my uh, del del y of uh, uh, del del w of y which is my uh, output of this summation block in my neurons. So together uh, this is what will help me in getting down my total gradient computation. Now the first part of this gradient which is uh, the grade uh, uh, which is some sort of a derivative of the cost function. If you look into the second part of the gradient then you see that it is a derivative of the nonlinear transfer function. And if you look into the third part of the derivative, that is a derivative of the linear network itself. And these three things together are what will be helping me in uh, finding out the gradient part for my uh, whole network in order to learn. So with this, um, I will uh, end up our lecture for today uh, over here. And uh, in the subsequent uh, lecture, we would be starting up with this point on gradient computation and subsequently uh, going down uh, to how this can be extended for a multilayer perceptron and then enter into eventually the deep learning and uh, how to train down these deep neural networks and then uh, what will be the existential criteria. So with that, uh, thank you and stay tuned for the next lecture.